Let me begin by telling you what Slay the Princess is not about. It is not a story about a man who lived at the end of the universe. A man who witnessed untold amounts of suffering and death and was so angry and so sad that he reached into the cosmic winds and grasped the cycle of life and death. With all his anger and all his pain, he ripped the cycle in half. One side was made of pure transformation. It would be called the Shifting Mound. She contained within her all the universe's capacity for change and transformation, and thus, within her multitudes, she contained death. The other half, which contained everything else, would become known as the Long Quiet. They were both gods, but they had forgotten themselves. They had forgotten one another. The man who hated the Shifting Mound, for she contained death, knew that she could only be destroyed by another god, the Long Quiet. And the man, full of hubris, believed he could convince the Long Quiet to kill the Shifting Mound, since the newborn god had long forgotten his origins. In his last mortal act, the man sacrificed himself to create a construct. At least, that's what the man called it. But in truth, he created a prison for the two gods. As part of the construct, he created an echo of himself and placed it in the ear of the Long Quiet. This would give him the illusion of authority over the Long Quiet. He called the echo the narrator because the narrator's job is to tell a story. And the narrator hoped he could tell the story of the Long Quiet killing the Shifting Mound, defeating death forever. This fable is just the backstory of Slay the Princess. And if you complete the game and speak to the narrator, finally demanding answers from him after hours of navigating his construct, this is what you'll learn. From his perspective, this is the story of Slay the Princess. Though, it's not really, is it? Slay the Princess is a love story. When you first boot up the game, you're met with a screen that emphasizes this very point. This is a love story. The game begins. You're on a path in the woods. And at the end of that path is a cabin. And in the basement of that cabin is a princess. You're here to slay her. If you don't, it will be the end of the world. You have no idea you're a god called the Long Quiet. You have no idea you're being asked to kill death. You can ask the narrator why you have to kill the princess, and he'll tell you. I'm talking about the end of everything as we know it. No more birds, no more trees, and perhaps most problematically of all, no more people. Okay. When you get to the cabin, you find a pristine blade. If you take it with you to the basement, the princess calls to you on the stairs. Who's there? But if you don't take the knife, she sounds different. Hello? Is someone there? Either she knows whether or not we have the knife and is responding in a way she believes will be to her advantage, or the princess is, in some sense, the shifting mount, the personification of transformation and change. So when we indicate a belief or feeling about her, whether she witnesses it or not, she'll embody the truth of that belief. If we take the knife, it's because we think we'll need it. There might be something sinister about her. Her personality, what she is, will constantly change and shift, depending on our actions throughout the game. Chapter 1 of Slay the Princess ends in 10 different ways, leading to 10 different versions of Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, the cabin and princess change to reflect our actions in Chapter 1. We might choose to face off toe-to-toe -to -toe in Chapter 1, and she'll become an adversary hungry to fight us in Chapter 2. We might choose to trap her downstairs in Chapter 1, fearing that she possesses some unknown sinister power. And in Chapter 2, she'll have found that power and gladly use it against us. Though it's not just the princess and the cabin changing between chapters. In Chapter 1, there's only two voices in our head, the narrator and the voice of the hero. Each subsequent chapter awakens a new voice that will join in, arguing with the other two. For example, if we trap the princess in the basement of chapter one, 
our fear will awaken the voice of the paranoid. Chapter 2 will likely lead you to chapter 3, and sometimes even chapter 4, but no matter how many chapters you find, almost every route ends the same. The princess escapes the cabin, with or without your help. And then... I'm cold. Is being happy supposed to be so cold? she's absorbed back into the shifting mound. Now, an aside here. If you're going to enjoy Slay the Princess, you've got to let your brain bend a little bit. The princess is the shifting mound, and this rat king of arms that is lovingly called Shifty by the community is also the shifting mound. And this uber princess you encounter at the end of the game is also the shifting mound. Additionally, we play as the long quiet, but the long quiet is also a place. Shifty comes to slurp away our princess. The cabin and forest disappear, and we return to the long quiet. So we're playing as the long quiet, while in the long quiet. As a fun aside, what exactly we look like as the long quiet is obscured throughout the game. Though we can infer that we're bird-like in some way, the princess's different pet names for us reveal she's seeing something bird-like when she looks at us. Silly little bird face. The little bird has returned to me. Fledgling. Bird! Interestingly, this dark wavy line pattern that the long quiet is made up of kind of resembles feathers. And at the beginning of a new chapter, where the long quiet serves as the backdrop for the title card, we see these wavy lines give way to, yeah, actual feathers. Kind of a neat observation I wanted to share. Okay, moving on. We only speak to this version of the shifting mound between routes. She's kind of a trip. I love her. She's like if a Sylvia Plath poem came to life. Thoughts without connections. A dim and nascent network. I wish to be more. When we speak to her, she gives us cryptic answers about who we are, what we are, and what our purpose is. She is by far the nicest and most understanding conversationalist in the game, but she doesn't seem to know too much. She knows that she's unfinished, and she asks that we bring her more perspectives. Nerves and fibers to feel the worlds beyond. Perspectives to make my own. When the shifting mound comes to take a princess, she's harvesting a perspective of herself. And she's using each of these perspectives to reconstitute herself. She knows not exactly into what. It's all instinct to her. Like us, she's not yet aware of her godhood. If we try to leave the shifting mound or the long quiet, she says this. What textures will you weave for yourself to occupy forever? Will you place the images of you and I into a box for safekeeping? If you close that box, will you become another you in another world? An imaginary pattern repeating itself until it can no longer bear the weight of its hand-drawn cage. You'll always come back to the box, because you'll always want to know what it means to be you. I will be here waiting by your side, until you're ready to return to mine. Oh! Like a window box. I get it. Throughout the five different routes that make up a single playthrough, the princess will meet multiple tragic ends. And she'll end us at least twice as often. Everything goes dark, and you die. You'll hear the narrator say that enough times that it starts to feel nostalgic. There will be moments when that message at the start of the game, this is a love story, will feel like a cruel joke. But the insane thing is, it is a love story. One of the most realistic love stories I've ever experienced in media. At this point, I've well and truly spoiled the main plot of Slay the Princess. And I'm going to talk about a good chunk of the different routes you can find, but we won't have time to cover all of them. And I'm going to entirely skip some of the best routes in the game. After watching this video, you should have a pretty good background in what this game is about and what it's like, but there will still be a lot left to experience. 
I'm writing this video months before the free mega update comes out, Slay the Princess, the pristine cut, which is going to include a lot more routes and new content. So this is by no means a comprehensive video or Slay the Princess Explained type of video. My intention here is to provide a springboard for your own analysis. It's one possible interpretation of the game, with my own experiences and biases folded in. I'm going to touch on only one of the themes of the piece, love, and my analysis won't be correct and it won't be complete. There's no one correct analysis of Slay the Princess. You'll have to play the game yourself to come to your own conclusions. And if you see those conclusions not reflected here, please leave a comment because I would genuinely love to hear how you interpreted this extremely rich and nuanced game. Oh, Katie, I have an interpretation. Oh my gosh, Catburger, hey! Hi everybody, I I'm Catburger. I see you there, Catburger, the star of the channel. So I think Slay the Princess is actually about something I've been thinking a lot about lately. It really resonates for me, baseball. Think about it, the roar of the crowd, the crack of the bat. The boys of summer are back. It's all here. You start at a path. That's what is the path? spring training. Okay. You know, you're just down there in the Cactus League, and then you have to go swing something on a base mint against the So the, the knife princess. is a bat. The knife is a bat, is okay. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I get it. It is like a basement. Mm -hmm. She's the shifting mound. Ex exactly. Randy Johnson killed a bird once. Mm-hmm. Baseball's about rhythms. You know, they say that baseball is a perfect mechanism for passing a summer's day. Right. And so rhythms and cycles, those feel so similar. And in so many ways, Slay the Princess is about doing the same thing over slightly differently, slightly differently. You know, is it a single, a double, a triple? Every every spring, we with the boys of summer, they come right back out and we, we continue this rhythm each year, ending and unending. That's a beautiful story. I almost feel like, I almost feel like, like, what's the point of me reading my essay? Like, I feel like you've, you've done it better than I ever could have. Well, I mean, baseball's hot for me. I love dingers. I love hitting dingers. Look at them go. And, but, but for you, perhaps, maybe, maybe you got something else different about it. I'd really like to hear your story. How are you affected by Slay the Princess? Oh, well, that's really nice of you to ask. So yeah. I'm, I'm allowed to continue my script then? Yeah, I mean, you know, presumably it's all going to be about the postseason or, or something about, you know, hard-nosed baseball. That's probably where this is going, right? Well, I guess you'll have to find out. What happens if you refuse to go to the cabin? All right, I'll see you. And never meet the princess? First, you'll end up back at the cabin. But what if you turn away again? What if you keep turning away forever? Eventually, the cabin finds you. Through the forest, we see its windows reflect light back at us, like the eyes of a predator. Eventually, the forest gives way to nothing but cabins. Infinite cabins stretching into the horizon. There's nowhere to go but cabin. You lose track of time, and chapter two begins. In chapter two, the stranger, there's a wall around the forest. We've got no choice here but to proceed to the cabin this time. But it's different. Usually in Chapter 2, the cabin takes on some characteristic of the princess that contains it. A temple for a goddess. A jungle for a predator. But in The Stranger, you've never met, have we? With no input from us, the princess was unsure how to remake herself. And that uncertainty shows... The cabin has branched into its many possible versions, all at the same time. The result is a confusing patchwork of cabins from all the different chapters. Nevertheless, knife or not, we continue down the stairs. As we descend, reality begins to dissolve. Time ceases to mean anything, and the narrator says this. Physical sensations dull and then vanish until the only things experienced are the endless, repeating patterns and emotions of the journey, a continuous march forward to a destination long forgotten. Consumption and betrayal, skepticism and blind devotion, rivalry and submission, terror and longing, pain and unfamiliarity. And at the heart of it all, an emotion that can only be described as each arm of the spiral represents one of the ten possible Chapter 2 princesses. Each arm is assigned an opposite as well, putting pairs of Chapter 2 princesses and their voices in opposition to each other. By comparing each pair of princesses, we can begin to understand what Slay the Princess believes about love. Consumption and Betrayal This pair of arms puts consumption, a furry, jungle-like arm, in opposition to betrayal, 
a viney arm adorned with thorns. Visually, these arms seem to relate to Chapter 2, The Beast, where the cabin basement becomes a dense jungle housing a beastly predator princess, and Chapter 2, The Witch, where the princess is surrounded by muddy, thorny vines and cackles suspiciously at our every move. We can get to both of these routes by, in Chapter 1, going downstairs unarmed, but then changing our mind and going back upstairs to retrieve the knife. We return downstairs and find the princess has gnawed off her own arm to escape her chains, and she's now hiding in the shadows. If we close the door behind us, we're trapped downstairs together, and she fights us fiercely, like an animal. She inevitably wins, sending us to chapter two, The Beast, where we are accompanied to the cabin with the voice of the hunted. We need clear thoughts and pricked ears. Listening to hunted is the only way to survive this chapter. And if we don't listen to him, (coughs) the beast attacks us and swallows us whole. Consumption. The relationship between a chapter two princess and the corresponding voice you're accompanied with is always interesting to look at. In this case, the hunted is a natural foil to the beast, a predator who is hunting us. While hunted and the beast have diametrically opposed goals, they speak the same language. In contrast, we meet the witch, accompanied by the voice of the opportunist. There's nothing wrong with looking out for number one. He's even puffing us up by telling us he completely agrees with our every decision. Very pragmatic. That is why you're in charge. The theme of betrayal in this chapter is undeniable. Opportunist and the witch are both constantly scheming. She appears shackled to a wall, but this is just a trick to give us the impression that she's helpless. Opportunist, meanwhile, advocates to free the witch, not because he believes she's innocent, but so she'll turn her back on us long enough to stab her. Like the beast and hunted, the witch and opportunist have opposing goals. They each want to be the last one standing. If I were her, I'd betray us. Both routes here feature a cat-like princess, and both routes are focused on survival. Hunted and beast use their instincts, while opportunist and witch use their wit and wiles. These routes show us two ways that love does not work. Survival is a prerequisite for love, so it's something we have to figure out how to do. However, it's all too easy for survival to eclipse love. If we act on instinct alone, we might treat those who seek to love us as threats, and eventually one will consume the other entirely. Survival also requires us to negotiate our own needs when they diverge from our loved one? Should we treat those negotiations as a game with a winner and a loser? Feelings of betrayal are inevitable. Love cannot survive if we're only concerned with how we'll survive. Skepticism and blind devotion. The second pair of arms shows blind devotion as a braid of hair evoking images of Rapunzel, a damsel in distress. All this is in opposition to skepticism, which is shown as chain links. Visually, these seem to represent chapter two's The Damsel, where we meet a very princessy princess, and chapter two's The Prisoner, who has tripled the number of chains locking her in the basement, even now sporting a chain around her neck. Freeing her by slicing her arm off is no longer an option. We find both of these routes by choosing to rescue the princess in chapter one. If we try to leave together, the narrator won't like it, and he'll protest by beginning to narrate what he wishes us to be doing instead. He summons the knife into the basement, if we didn't already bring it down with us, and forces us to attack the princess. If we warn her, she realizes that our actions are no longer our own. If we didn't bring the knife with us into the basement, The princess, a timid creature by our own estimation, will be terrified and stab us artlessly over and over and over, and we will painfully and slowly die. That'll take us to chapter two, the damsel. However, 
if we originally brought the blade with us to the basement. A cold and calculating version of the princess will surgically slice us once and will die as painlessly as possible. This introduces us to chapter two, The Prisoner. We meet the damsel accompanied by the voice of the smitten. She's a perfect angel that you cruelly imprisoned as part of some convoluted, dastardly scheme. Whose blind devotion to the princess is made obvious in literally everything he says. Then you should know that we and the princess are in love. Maybe it's her beauty that threatens the world. We're going to sweep her off her feet if it's the last thing anyone does. Dude will not shut up about her. Smitten believes he's in love, but because the shifting mound will always reflect what the long quiet believes of her, Smitten's idea of what love is quickly makes itself apparent. I just want to make you happy. 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 Smitten has no idea who he's in love with, and by idealizing the object of his affection, he's hollowed out the princess. Smitten does not love the princess. He loves his idea of the princess. An idea that flattens the more we interrogate it, literally objectifying her. In contrast, the prisoner is accompanied by the voice of the skeptic. You're talking in circles. So the theme of skepticism is obvious. Skeptic and the prisoner are both ruled by logic. Unlike the always emotional smitten and damsel, even if we approach the prisoner without a knife, she will firmly, but calmly, insist we keep our distance. Reasoning that, given how chapter one went, our actions don't always reflect our intentions. Skeptic is also a logic lord. He's able to correctly deduce that, despite everything biology tells us, the princess will survive when she cuts off her own head. The routes are visually connected by the princess's relationship to her chains. The damsel is effectively unshackled due to her small, dainty hands easily slipping the chains. And the prisoner, well, she's got no shortage of chains. Both routes explore how we make decisions. Sometimes we're motivated by blind devotion to make a grand gesture, other times by cold logic and skepticism to do the most reasonable thing. Love requires action and is never gonna blossom if no one decides to do anything about it. However, if we rely too much on our emotions to motivate that decision, allowing our heart to guide us without considering any information about our partner, we risk losing touch with the reality of the person that we love. We see them as an object instead of the complex creature they are. On the other hand, if we allow our decisions to be ruled entirely by logic, we're shackling ourselves to reason. Both parties will always keep one another at a distance. And that's the most reasonable course of action to ensure you never get hurt. Rivalry and submission. The third pair of arms shows rivalry as crossing barbs and submission as Greek columns rising forth. The columns visually seem to represent chapter two, the tower, where we meet a version of the princess who's become a goddess in a Greek temple-like cabin. The crossing barbs appear to visually represent chapter two's the adversary. But it's not immediately clear to me what about this iconography is reminiscent specifically of that chapter. If you see the visual connection here, please leave a comment and let me know what it is. But through the process of elimination, I'm fairly certain this arm relates to the adversary. We get to both of these chapters by engaging the princess in a fight. We can either give up immediately and allow her to destroy us, or we can continue to fight her until we're both exhausted and die at the same time. By refusing to give up, we meet the adversary. This chapter is accompanied by the voice of the stubborn. Enough with the talking, we've got a fight to win. And he's itching for a rematch against the princess. My favorite ending in The Adversary occurs if we listen to the stubborn and engage the princess in a never ending fight. This eternal rivalry makes the theme of this chapter obvious. They're both thrilled with this conclusion, gleefully wailing on each other forever. and. Honestly, they're kind of perfect for each other. But if we give up the fight in chapter one, we'll be accompanied to the tower by the voice of the broken. Why should we even bother? 
we might as well just walk up to that cabin, break her chains, and let her do whatever she wants. The Broken has an unwavering belief that the princess is infinitely powerful and deserves our undying devotion. The connection of this chapter to submission is clear. If we listen to Broken and pledge our eternal allegiance to our new goddess, she reaches down towards us, a loving expression on her face. She claims we've earned a place at her side, not as an equal, but as a priest or a pet. Broken is thrilled by this outcome, believing we've fulfilled our role in his goddess's ascent. We have entirely given up our will in favor of our love for her. These routes are visually connected by the larger-than-life quality of the princesses. One, a heavenly goddess, the other, sporting devilish horns and taking the moniker, the adversary. Together, they explore the role of will in relationships. Love requires the will of both participants to remain in balance. In the tower, we allow our will to be entirely dissolved by the goddess towering above us, and the result is a relationship that will always have a power imbalance. While both parties seem happy, this relationship can never support a meaningful back and forth. If there's a conflict where Broken isn't getting some need he has met, there's no way for him to assert himself, because they aren't equals. However, the adversary and the stubborn demonstrate how having too much will is bad for a relationship. Neither one will ever back down. They'll continue to fight for all eternity, and no conflict is ever getting resolved. In both cases, even though everybody seems like they're getting what they want out of the situation, no one here is capable of growing or changing. Terror and Longing This pair of arms puts terror, an arm made up of eyes entwined in darkness, in opposition to longing, an arm made up of different trails of white smoke, or is it ghostly ectoplasm? This arm appears to represent Chapter 2, The Spectre, where we meet a ghostly princess. This opposite arm is a reference to the blinking eyes in the background of The Nightmare, where we meet a terrifying doll-faced princess able to stop our heart with a mere glance. If, in Chapter 1, we kill the princess without hesitation, we'll meet the spectre, accompanied by the voice of the cold. This is boring. Cold is unconcerned with killing the princess because he knows she's already dead. At the cabin, the princess is still in the basement, but she's just bones now. A moment later, a ghostly visage floats up from the floor. Hiya, Keller. Cold reacts to Spectre with, Oh, wow. How absolutely terrifying. Almost a light. Not out of any kind of spite or relief. Cold feels nothing. He's very insistent about that point. If you all just stopped feeling, we could have been done with this ages ago. No, he reacts because finally something interesting is happening. Cold doesn't care about the narrator or the princess. The only thing that he wants, that he longs for, is something new. The specter is also defined by her longing, but instead of novelty, she craves freedom. She'll gladly put aside her annoyance with us for killing her, as long as we allow her to possess us so we can leave the cabin together. She even agrees to allow us control of our body. She really just wants to be free, and freedom is only available through the undeniably intimate act of possession of two souls sharing one body. We get to the nightmare by locking the princess away instead of killing her. At the time, it seems a reasonable enough solution. Killing someone when we don't have all the facts seems a little, well, cold. Sorry, cold. That's fine. We've met her. She seems harmless enough. So we'll just stand guard here on that 0.0000001% chance that she is a threat and everyone will be fine, right? I don't think I need to clarify why the nightmare is terrifying. When we meet her in chapter two, we've awakened the voice of the paranoid. Don't trust anyone. A voice entirely ruled by fear. A perfect foil for the agent of terror the princess has become. It's only because we have paranoid with us 
that we're able to survive the encounter. Our fear of the princess has manifested with such accuracy that even just seeing her causes our body to shut down. It's Paranoid who saves the day when we see her next in Chapter 2. Heart. Lungs. Liver. Nerves. He is intimately familiar with what it means to be afraid. So he has the genius idea to keep our autonomic nervous system functioning by consciously focusing on it, using his chant as a tool to remind him to keep focusing on the systems we need to survive. Fun fact, I forgot the term autonomic nervous system while writing, so I went back to look it up to make sure I understood what it was. It's the part of your brain that makes breathing and organ function unconscious, so you can do cool stuff like think your thoughts. So I had to read about it for a minute to make sure I had the right term. And then I started thinking about it and how fragile my existence is. And what if my autonomic nervous system just stopped working suddenly? And how terrifying it would be to lose control over something so core to me. And it wouldn't actually be losing control of anything because it all happens unconsciously all the time anyway. And oh God, I don't actually have any control. I'm just tiny electric pulses firing between neurons. And it was at this point that I had to go get my blood pressure medicine because I've been to enough therapy to hear a panic attack whistle in the distance while my fear is tying me to the train tracks. Throughout this chapter, we hear paranoid constantly in the background. Heart, lungs, liver, nerves. The chant eventually becomes part of the soundtrack, creating a truly inspired moment where the narrative design meets aesthetic appeal. After talking to Nightmare, we realize that, like Spectre, she is only focused on her freedom. But she makes certain to mention what will happen to us. She'll keep us with her, forever, like a good luck charm. Before I dissected this spiral of arms, I assumed that cold and smitten would be opposites. One's consumed by love, the other has no capacity for love. But after thinking about it further, Putting Cold and Spectre in opposition to Paranoid and Nightmare makes way more sense. While Paranoid is ruled by his fear of the princess, Cold is unable to feel fear. Both routes involve ghostly princesses. One, a friendly Casper, and the other, a terrifying doll face that can stop our autonomic nervous system. And both routes involve a princess who wants nothing more than to keep us close. I believe these routes are exploring how our fears of intimacy and freedom interact with each other. Both princesses are grappling very directly with how their freedom is only accessible through intimacy. That reality is either a source of longing or something to fear. Pain and unfamiliarity. Unfamiliarity in this pair of arms is represented by the twisting and looping staircases we met in Chapter 2's The Stranger, while pain on the other arm is represented by many sharp razors budding from one another, evoking a fractal pattern made entirely of dangerous edges. This is evocative of Chapter 2's The Razor. In Chapter 1, if we wonder, even for a moment, if the princess is armed, She'll manifest a weapon to meet our expectations and stab us with it, sending us directly into Chapter 2, The Razor. Joined by the voice of the cheated. This whole thing's a crock of sh- We return to the cabin and meet a princess who is... What? No! No! I wouldn't stab you! Not as sneaky as she thinks. Cheated will say what we're already thinking. I have absolutely zero doubts that she is going to stab us if we get close to her. And before too long, we learn why she's called the Razor. She is a Razor. I'm going to kill you now. And with a squelch, she does just that. The association of this route with pain is clear. She doesn't stop after she kills you the first time either. The sequence that follows has us try different strategies to survive the Razor's onslaught. We try to flatter her like Smitten would. She skewers you. We refuse to give up the fight like Stubborn would. She skewers you. Each strategy awakens a new voice. And by the end, the gang's all here. Through the pain she's inflicted on us, we have found ourselves. Our true, complicated, 
messy self. On the other hand, we meet the stranger just after we encounter this image. We avoided the cabin in chapter one and began chapter two, the stranger, accompanied by the voice of the contrarian. If he wants us to take it, maybe we should just leave it to collect dust, or better yet, grab it and throw it out the window. Contrarian's a real stinker. At the bottom of those many looping staircases, we finally meet the stranger. At first, she's just a normal chapter one princess. Though, once we ask her anything, the stranger makes herself known. She begins to fracture into many different princesses, and our own actions are no longer singular. You take a step forward. Your foot lands, but it lands different. You experience a firm footfall, a gentle tread, a confident stride. Rather than selecting our next action, these three options are now all just one option, and we're going to do all three things at once. The stranger is revealed, a melted Cronenberg monster of a woman. She's confused and in pain, and she has no understanding of what she is. Without an observer to place an expectation on her, she's falling apart. The razor and the stranger are perfect antipodes, both exploring the role of self-knowledge in love and relationships. By repeatedly slamming ourselves against the razor, through another inflicting pain on us, we gain an understanding of ourselves that's hard won. And by failing to observe the princess, she gains no understanding of who she is. She is a stranger, not only to us, but to herself. Understanding is an essential component of any relationship, especially understanding ourselves. Though my reading here, without additional context, implies something I do not believe. While self-knowledge can be gained through pain and trauma, I don't believe it's the only path to understand yourself. And I think Slay the Princess would agree with me on this point. There's one aspect of our many travels to the cabin that I've been carefully omitting. In each chapter two, the cabin is changed to reflect the princess contained, but there's also an additional piece of furniture present. The narrator doesn't include a mirror in his description. If we press him on it... That's because there isn't a mirror. There's a table, the, the blade sitting on the table, and the door to the basement. There's nothing else in here. And as far as I can tell, the narrator truly does not see the mirror. What the mirror is, exactly, is a subject of debate within the community. Is it a portal into the construct that the narrator sees us through? Is it a creation of the shifting mound intended to show us some truth about the world that we're in? I'm here to tell you, once and for all, what the mirror is. It doesn't matter to try and force a literal reason for the mirror into a narrative as existential and metaphorical as this one is futile, and it risks stripping the mirror of its meaning and role in the story. I can tell you what the mirror represents, self-reflection. In chapter two, the mirror appears in the cabin. The narrator won't describe it, claims not to see it, and if we approach it, the voice of the hero says the mirror is dirty and we should wipe it clean. The mirror doesn't look dirty, but we also can't see ourselves clearly in it. So if we reach forward to touch it, it disappears. When we get to chapter two, we've already failed one quote relationship with the princess. Resolving conflict in an intimate relationship usually requires some self-reflection. A good hard look in the mirror, if you will. However, we, as the long quiet, are incomplete. We gained a new voice in chapter two, but we're still not ourselves. We don't know who we are, and we're fractured into way too many pieces to perform any meaningful self-reflection. When Spectre possesses us, she notes our current state. So this is what it's like to be you, huh? Disembodied voice narrating your every move? All these shards of broken glass on the floor, are they also supposed to be you? So we can't yet see ourselves. The opportunity for self-reflection slips from our grasp. In this video, I've avoided talking about any possible chapter threes, mostly for the sake of time. In fact, each pair of routes here share a chapter three that you can get to from either chapter two. And there's definitely some additional juicy analysis to be done on those shared chapter threes, as well as the other chapter threes that are unique to individual chapter twos. 
So something to think about during your own playthroughs. In chapter three though, the mirror has moved. No longer on the side, it sits in front of the door. You have to interact with it before you proceed to see the princess. With two failed attempts at this relationship under your belt, the need for self-reflection is more urgent now. However, again, you have yet to discover yourself fully. So again, attempting to wipe the mirror clean causes it to disappear. It's not until the end of a route, after the shifting mound takes the princess and we return to the long quiet, that we see the mirror again. This time, the voice of the hero, previously curious about the mirror, is afraid of it. And with good reason. Approaching the mirror makes all the voices in your head disappear, possibly wiping the slate clean, or as I interpret it, turning all those voices from external noise in your brain to an internalized part of the way that you think, solidifying you as one complex individual. You are finally able to wipe the mirror clean in order to look at yourself. In each of these routes, we see a demonstration of a failed relationship. Survival, willpower, understanding, emotion and logic, intimacy and freedom, these are all necessary components of a relationship. Too much or too little of any one of these can be the death of a relationship or worse, result in something toxic that no longer resembles love. It's only through self-reflection through looking in the mirror that we can move forward to learn from our previous mistakes and try again, always seeking to love better than we did before. Slay the Princess takes two participants in a relationship and breaks them into their component parts. We play as the long quiet, but we begin with only one aspect of ourself, the voice of the hero and we collect more aspects as we try and fail to interact with the princess. The shifting mound, meanwhile, requires us to interact with her in order to develop perspectives that she absorbs in an effort to make herself whole. Stories where we atomize a single character into their component parts are not new, and it's one of my favorite tropes. The experience of being human is so contradictory and surprising to me it's just always felt right that inside me is a bunch of little guys running around my brain, working in a factory or arguing at a war table. Slay the Princess takes this trope a step further. It places component parts across from each other on a color wheel of failed relationships, using the constructed dichotomies to explore how difficult it is to figure out how to love someone. It drives home the importance of self-reflection in that learning process. Each failed relationship is met by the suggestion of self-reflection. How did they hurt you? How did you hurt them? How do the sharp edges of each shard of our souls dictate our actions? Interpreting a work like this is delicate. It's not so much a piece with a decisive single moral as it is a book of poems about love and life. But it's also a visual novel with a cohesive plot. Abby and Toby Howard of Black Tabby Games wrote a story about the interior life of a relationship. But they also wrote a story about the duality of the cycle of life and death, a law of the universe more rigidly enforced than Newton's laws of motion. This story is very focused on what goes on inside our hearts, while also literally being about the entire universe. And that sounds so pretentious when I say it, but the writing is funny and the dialogue is so real. And there's so many branches and different paths I could take. I felt like that moment when you step into an amusement park and your inner child jumps up and says, what are we gonna do first? It's a magic trick of narrative design. A story like this had to be told as a visual novel. It's about exploring the many fractured components of the self so a linear narrative just wouldn't do it. By instead making this game a choose your own adventure story, they made something where the different pathways you take can overlap each other, all while acknowledging the route that you took to get there. It's an experience only available through the medium of a video game, and they've used the medium masterfully. I saw myself in the long quiet, bumbling through interactions, feeling like no matter what I do, I'm bound to hurt the person across from me. 
I saw myself in the voices, terrified by the idea of self-reflection when confronted with the mirror. I saw myself in the narrator, believing the solution was to cut myself off from everyone around me, to exist in unchanging, untampered ignorance. But most of all, I saw myself in the princess. When I was younger, I thought I had to shift myself, to mold myself to the expectations of people who said they loved me. I was certain they wouldn't be interested in the real me. They would find my many facets and multitudes confusing and hard to keep track of. I think in long-term relationships, it's easy to start to assign roles. This is an especially easy pitfall in heterosexual relationships as society's gone ahead and prepackaged some handy gender roles for you. But it's by no means limited to those relationships. Maybe you're the friendly one who's great at parties or the shy one who's kind of an introvert. Maybe you're the organized one or the messy one. It's so easy to take one of these roles you're given and make it central to your identity. And even if it's given entirely out of love, it's gonna make you feel boxed in. Shy people can be extroverted and neat people can be messy. In reality, we each contain multitudes and conflicting perspectives. And when someone outside of us perceives and accepts all those multitudes, it can feel suspiciously like... An emotion that can only be described as... And I think that's what's so powerful to me about this story. Progress looks like seeking and understanding all the contradictory aspects of yourself and accepting each one as all part of you. This is a game as much about self-love as it is loving someone else, as it should be. After all, as a wise philosopher once said, You can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? Can I get an amen in here? We don't have a lot of stories about long-term relationships, and the stories that we have are very rarely happy. Sure, there's poems or passages commonly read at weddings, Love is patient. Love is kind. I think Corinthians is the classic example I'm thinking of here. But these are often dismissed as cliche because unfortunately, Corinthians more or less accurately describes what I've learned about relationships in my many years of flailing around trying to figure it out. However, Corinthians is totally unhelpful when it comes to explaining what it's like to be in a long-term relationship. Explaining what it's like to be in a long-term relationship is kind of like explaining what it's like to be alive. I don't know, weird, mostly okay, sometimes very bad. Ultimately, I'm glad to be doing it. Was that a helpful answer? Each person is a singular arrangement of atoms, making up molecules, making up cells, making up nerves, that are assisting little pulses of electricity and memories and beliefs and values. And that is why no two people are the same. And every day, some cells die and new ones are born. Some memories are forgotten and new ones are made. And we change our mind about what kind of soda we like best. The pleasure of a long-term relationship is knowing someone who is not you. Someone who observes these changes in you every day and loves you through each one. And in turn, you observe those changes in them, and you see them drinking a cherry Coke, and you go, you used to hate cherry Coke, and you marvel at how they are new. It's in listening to them make the same complaint about the same poorly designed intersection that they've been complaining about for five years, and marvel that they are still somehow the same and completely different all at once. It's in telling them why you hate that grocery store because it's always so busy and them nodding and saying, yeah, I see what you're saying about that grocery store. I actually like that grocery store because the carts are so well maintained and thinking to yourself, well, they don't appreciate the importance of a quiet grocery store. They'll never really understand me and trusting that they can still love you despite never really understanding you. It's a promise you make to always try and keep up with that ever-changing mass of cells and neurons and impulses and thoughts and beliefs and values across the table from you. A long-term relationship means waking up one day 
and realizing neither one of us is the person we expected to become when this began. And the people we've become wouldn't exist without the other. We've hurt each other and loved each other out of survival, out of devotion or reason, out of desires for intimacy or freedom, out of sheer willpower or lack thereof, and out of a need to be understood. I don't know who I would have been if I hadn't taken the time to build this thing with you, but I do know I love this version of me that has come to love this version of you, and tomorrow will be different and learn to love each other anew. All that is a hard thing to write a story about because there's no apparent conflict here. Conflict is ever present in long-term relationships. But if the stakes around that conflict get too high or go for too long, you won't feel safe. And love and safety go hand in hand. So writing dramatic tension for something that nuanced and complex is hard to pull off. And yet, Slay the Princess pulls it off by breaking a relationship down into its component, most conflicted chapters. Chapters of terror or longing, of rivalry or submission, and weaving these chapters into new chapters and even deeper, more intractable complexities. It's captured the feeling of struggling with the parts of your relationship that are bad and working through all that sh one f interaction at a time. Thank you so much for watching. This was a roller coaster of a script to write and an absolute monster to edit. So I really appreciate you taking the time to check it out. A huge thanks goes out to the Black Tabby Games Discord community. I loved chatting about lore and theories with some of y'all. It's just a really warm and welcoming community, so I can't recommend it enough. If you liked the video, please consider subscribing. It really does mean a lot to me. I have a few other videos you can see on the screen right now if you like this one and you want more, but otherwise... Okay, fine, you took the knife, but you really shouldn't hold it like that. Then how are we supposed to hold it? The other way, thumb at the bottom, will look much cooler and more serious if we hold it with our thumb at the bottom. Yes! Isn't this so much better?